Okay, so it is noon on the nose, and we are going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, make sure our stream is going well. And then, um, so this is our first high noon of the season and of the series, and we're really, really excited to open it up with Kristen Martin, who is uh, a really good friend of mine. Kristen holds a Bachelor of Science degree in history. And I have a, I'm sorry, there we go. Uh, so Kristen holds a Bachelor of Science degree in history through Newman University. And she leads education exhibits and collections work in the programs department at the Museum of World Treasures, which is in Wichita, Kansas, uh, which is where she's joining us from, which is really exciting. Her recent work at the Museum of World Treasures includes advocating for further policies, protecting the collection and preservation of ephemera. Uh, she has built her career from Newman University. Now she's in charge of the entire programs department and works really closely with the Museum of World Treasures, which has a fantastic collection. Uh, I have known Kristen since 2015, I believe. And since then we have collaborated quite frequently with the Mountain Plains Museums Association. We both actually serve on the board of directors there. And I am really excited to hear about Kristen's work in really getting to the root of why people crave physical connections to objects. Uh, why are people driven to collect these things? And how does that relate to museum work? How does that relate to what we do as museums? Uh, why do we specifically collect what we collect? And why do we want to see the authentic items that we go to museums to see? Now, we, I do have to say a special thank you to Yellowstone County for making today's program possible. And uh, with that, I am going to turn the floor over to Kristen. And if you have any questions during the program, feel free to just drop them in the comment box on Facebook. Uh, we have staff monitoring that and we will feed them to Kristen. We'll get them to Kristen at the end of her program. All right, so Kristen, take it away. Hi. Thank you, Lauren. I'm so excited to be presenting for you all today. So I wanted to start with a little introduction to where I am from, uh, for those of you who have maybe never been here. And as I'm coming in, I wanted to familiarize everyone. I am from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I wanted to show you guys a little picture of my hometown. So I was lucky enough to grow up here and to get a museum job here. Um, so here's our downtown skyline. And here, um, for those of you who can't see my pointer, on the left of the screen in a smaller snapshot is one of our uh, most prided items here. This is the Keeper of the Plains. It was created by a Comanche artist named Black Bear Boson in the 1970s and it stands next to the Arkansas River and it is a, a sort of gateway between the east and the west and we are very proud to have that piece. I also wanted to show a little video of the museum that I work at so that you can get just a little bit of an idea of what my background is. And as you start to see some of the items that we collect here, I wanted to give a bit of a flavor of what our museum is like. So this is just a one minute video. start with this amazing fossil gallery and then you literally just t take a trip through time. Here at the museum we're storytellers. Throughout history you'll see challenges that we've all faced. So I think museums in general are a great place to go explore issues like that and be inspired. To what can I do to help support change where change needs to happen? I want people to know that we have a space for them to feel connected to humanity. We have a space for them to feel that their story matters. 
we see the museum as a very important part of our community. We love this community. Actually, at the end of the video here, right to the left of the W in Wichita, you can see the Keeper of the Plains um, over the Arkansas River. Uh, and yes, for those of you not from Kansas, we do call it the Arkansas River. I'm not entirely sure why, but that's how it is here. <laughs> so you were able to see a little bit of my museum, and you probably noticed that our collection is somewhat eclectic. And I say that in um, the most fond way possible. We have fossils, we have items from Egypt, we have Buddhas, um, items from pre-Hispanic South America, Africa, and that's just the first floor. On the second floor, we have um, things from the American Revolution, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, uh, Vietnam, Korean Wars, you know, you dream it up, we, we may have it. So that really informs a lot of the collecting we do, and it informs my talk today. The items that you're going to see me highlighting are, some of them are on display and some of them are in our collections area. In our museum, only about 25%, probably even, I think actually we're down to 13. I think only 13% of the items that we have in our building are on display. The rest is in collections. This is for a variety of reasons, um, most of it being preservation. So, um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on my talk. So my talk is entitled, Why is this stuff so interesting? Subtitled, Why do we collect? I think this is a really important thing to think about uh, for visitors of museums and lovers of humanity, people who want to know what makes humans tick. But it's also a really important question for those of us who work at museums. It informs how we collect items, what we accept, how we put it out, how we group things together, how we write about it, how we talk about it. Um, and I was talking with Lauren about this before we got on. It's not something that we as museum workers always think about. And as I will go through and talk about, I think it is an important thing for really anyone to talk about, anyone who's interested in collecting or history or ancestry, um, understanding how we tick as far as wanting to keep items is such an interesting part of humanity. So we're going to talk about that today. So starting out, I would say most of us here on the top call have some experience of collecting. Either we ourselves collect items or we know people that can collect things. Uh, so off the top of my head, some of the things I can think of that are really common to collect would be um, dirt or wood from a place. So I know my grandma went to a cemetery where one of her relatives was buried and brought back a piece of wood from a tree. Um, you know, you know, people who go to the Holy Land and bring back some dirt from there. Um, we collect items that were used for special events. We collect wedding invitations. We collect the stuff that we wore. We collect... Um, uh, cards, you know, whatever. So we keep a lot of that. Um, this one probably is not quite as in vogue anymore, but well, the ashes are. Many of us keep ashes from relatives, but also hair and other items of the deceased and souvenirs. A lot of us keep souvenirs. This is one that we're going to talk about um, a little more in depth later in this talk. So the I guess crux of my talk or one of them is that the urge to collect can be observed both in the past and now. Something we're going to see throughout this talk is that I'm not going to only talk about people today and how they collect. I'm not going to only talk about how we buy souvenirs or how we keep stuff, but I'm also going to talk about people a long time ago and how we see them collecting things that are now being given to museums. Uh, that will be an important part of this talk, and it's an important part of most historical collections that you see. If you see an item from the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, most of those things were collected by people who lived at those times and passed down to today. Uh, so we want to look at those motivations. So why do we connect? We crave physical connection to the past. This is something that we can see uh, in, in the fact that these collections exist in the first place. Uh, I'm going to highlight three in particular reasons that we collect, but I will sh I'll show some more, but 
Uh, these three are things that I see really clearly in the collection here at the Museum of World Treasures. So one of them is collecting the history that interests us and our heritage. Last week, I was listening to a talk and the person said the difference between history and heritage is history is the whole story, all the facts and heritage is the history that we want to remember. Um, so we are looking on these items, some things that maybe we really like and some things that maybe we don't. But either way, we keep them because they remind us of that past. We're also going to talk about things that connect us to the experiences and places that we remember. And then finally, we're going to talk about collecting things that belong to the people we loved. Before I want to get into that, though, I do want to, oh, I, yes, I want to point out a few other reasons that people collect, and you will probably see some of these pop up along the way. Um, one that I think is rather interesting is collecting items that speak to our identity. And this goes to the heritage one I was talking about before. Um, so as many of you may know, uh, or maybe be familiar with, if you want to become a part of the Sons of the American Revolution or the Daughters of the American Revolution or the Mayflower Society, you must keep records that show that you are related to people from the American Revolution, from the Mayflower, etc. So these are one of the reasons we collect. Oftentimes we uh, keep items to establish family provenance. So family Bibles, military commissions, business records, et cetera. We see a lot of these coming in in our collection. We collect for investment, coins. Um, we collect, uh, I know some collectors here at the museum or loaners will keep items and they will loan them to the museum to be shown, but they are part of their retirement funds. They buy these expensive, awesome items and they're you know, going to let them be used. And then when they retire, they'll be able to sell these items. And um, it's a it's a financial thing. And then finally, as curios, this one, I think I really like because this one goes back to the history of the beginning of museums. I think a lot of us have heard about or are familiar with the idea of a museum as a cabinet of curiosities you know, that Victorian building where you go in and there's tons of glass cases filled with these taxidermy and specimens and dinosaurs that are put together wrong and all that. Um, this, this is really a beginning of museums as they are today. And certainly for the Museum of World Treasures here, there, there is a lot of that as well, um, which is so fun. I really love that. Uh, one more bit on why people collect. I pulled this from a gentleman named James Halperin. He uh, is highly recognized and awarded by the American Numismatic Society. So these are people who uh, collect ancient coins. So this guy really knows what he's talking about. He listed some reasons that I had not thought of on my own, but are definitely the case. And I'm sure many of you will relate to some of these. Knowledge and learning, relaxing, relaxation, relaxation, I'm sorry, relaxation and stress reduction. Uh, I know a lot of people who collect for that reason. Personal pleasure, uh, as we'll talk in the, in the next slide, uh, the founder of my museum, the Museum of World Treasures, this was, this was his main reason for collecting items of history. Uh, the pride of ownership, being connected to these things from the past, he loved it. So, social interaction with fellow collectors. This one we definitely see as well, particularly among military collectors. Uh, you know, you go to the gun show, you see what they have, you talk to your old buddies, tell them what you got. Uh, we see that a lot, as well as the competitive challenge. You want to get that, that item that your buddies don't have. Recognition by fellow collectors, altruism. This is a big one, especially where museums are involved. People like to collect things to be able to uh, educate future generations. I've seen several museums where um, this is, you know, this is a major driver of why the museum started in the first place. That would be our museum here. Um, Dr. John, our founder, did that to be able to educate children. Um, yeah, I, I've seen several museums that have this as, as a beginning. Uh, the desire to control, possess, or bring or order to a small or even massive part of the world. This one I find extremely interesting because you do have, I mean, I think many of us would relate to this. We have our stamp collection, we have our state quarter collection, 
and we have it all nice and pretty or we have our photos in a book and there's order in that part of the world. But I like how James Halperin here mentions bringing order to a massive part of the world. And I couldn't help but think of, you know, Hitler and his Fuhrer Museum where he would keep these items and it was his way of controlling uh, or hoping to control a court, the culture in this area of the world. We collect for nostalgia or connection to history. And we also collect for accumulation, accumulation and diversification of wealth, which I mentioned before, the security that comes from these items. All right, so today I am primarily going to highlight items in the museum collection. I am going to uh, notice a few other museums takes. So I will actually be highlighting a few places in Billings, as well as the World War I Museum in Kansas City. And then I will discuss how these, um, the motivations of collectors and our personal motivations as humans really affects how museums and history centers do what they do. So what does the collecting bug mean for a museum? Now, what do I mean by a collecting bug? Well, I don't mean a fiberglass termite on the top of a hearse. This is our museum. <laughs> this was a few years back. Uh, I just put this in for fun, but um, our, our pest control company had a little party in our museum to, uh, to celebrate the fact that they had killed termites in our museum. So there's that. That's not the collection bug. The collection bug, I got that term from our founder, Dr. John Kardatsky, who you can see here in the picture on the left, he is on the far right of that picture. And then on the right picture, it is him and his wife, Lorna. He talks about catching the collection bug when he visited Jerusalem in the Middle East and Egypt with his family when he was 17, as you can see on the left here. Uh, he got a coin from Herod the Great, and he says that that is when the collection bug started. And to me, that is, it is so interesting because he collected thousands of items over the course of his life coins, presidential signatures, Egyptian uh, mummies and sarcophagi and dinosaurs and that a visit to Jerusalem and getting a coin could do all of this is rather interesting. And for any of you who know someone who loves collecting, it, it is uncanny how many times I've heard people refer to collectors as, as addicted. And that is just so interesting to me that, that people that there are some people who love this so much that it becomes referred to as, as an addiction. Um, so clearly not all of us feel our connection to physical history in that way. Um, but it is definitely something that we see running throughout, especially our work in museums. And um, it does affect the way that we work. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So as I mentioned before, today we're not only going to talk about museum collectors like Dr. John, but also the people who originally grabbed these items. So we're going to start with talking about the history, I crossed out we love because I don't love some of this, that interests us in the heritage that we remember. Let's start out with George Washington's hair. This is an item in our collection. It is on display. Uh, I'm not sure if you can even see it very well on the screen here. It's even harder to see in real life. So what we have is a few strands of what appears to be white hair um, under a piece of plastic and on top of a piece of red paper or cardboard. Um, the interesting thing about this is that it has, to my knowledge, no provenance. We do not know where it came from. I think the even more interesting thing is I will show people this going through a tour and they will say, oh, have you done DNA testing on that? And I say, well, no, you know, we, we have not had the, the means to do so. And they'll say, oh, I don't care. I, I like it anyway. How interesting is that? And, and I feel that way about it as well. Funny enough, even as a museum person is, you know, maybe it's not, maybe, maybe it is, I, I can't say. Um, and we are very honest with people about that as we display it, you know, maybe it's not, it's, it's hard for us to say, but majority of people, love it anyway, that this even that there is even a possibility that this could be George Washington's hair, that we are standing right next to something that grew on George Washington's head. Oh man, we love that, don't we? Oh, that's why we go to museums, right? 
Here we have um, an item in the collection. So Dr. John, our founder, uh, collected signatures from every single president. Uh, and I guess I should mention just a brief aside about our museum. Uh, not everything we have belongs to our founder, Dr. John. Uh, there, the majority of our collection is from other people, but I am very familiar with his collection. So I like to work from his stuff um, a lot of the time. So here we have a commission written by uh, Thomas Jefferson or at least signed by Dr. Thomas Jefferson. And here at the bottom, very faintly above the uh, halberd or pike and the flags is Thomas Jeff Jefferson's signature. And again, how excited are we to see this stuff? Oh my goodness, to be able to pull out this document and see where Thomas Jefferson, one of our first presidents, one of the drafters of the Declaration of Independence, such a great mind, you know, built Monticello, all of these things. To be able to see where he touched that paper, oh my, you know, such an interesting thing. It connects us to this, and I don't even want to call it myth, legend, even though it's true, but to us it has become legendary. This bit of ink on paper has become a connection to these stories that we hold so close. All right, here's, here's an interesting one. And I, uh, this goes back to what Lauren was mentioning in my bio. So when I first started at the museum, I, I had not, this was my first museum I'd worked at and I'd not done a lot of work in museum collections. And oftentimes I was called upon to help make decisions on whether we should accept things. Now, every museum person, and I'm sure every person has their own opinions on what should go in a museum. And it's not as easy as you would think. You'd think, oh, is it historical? Yes, no, should we put it here? However, that's messy. What, you know, really we're here to tell a story about history. So one of the questions I like to ask is, will this item help us tell a story about history? Will it help us, uh, you know, understand people throughout history more? This item you see on the screen came in in December and we had the question, will we be accepting this? We do not have any provenance on this item, aside from what you see here. Uh, we don't know who Nan Miller is or Nancy Miller, I'm assuming. We know that it belonged to another museum at some point in time, and that's it. Um, and my colleagues really wanted to turn away this item. And, and I fully understand why, because we, I, I cannot say if this was a piece of General Lee's dressing gown, I cannot. But I do like this piece a lot because what does it say about us that, and, and about the collector who brought it in and really anyone who sees it that even though we don't know that this was a piece of General Lee's dressing gown, we still kept it and we still were interested in it, right? It, it tells us something uh, just about our psyche, right? And if it is, if it is a piece of his dressing gown, what's the story there? That's fascinating. Was somebody at his house and they, they snipped off a little piece of his dressing gown and pocketed it and then typed up a little thing for it and then gave it to a museum? We don't know, but it is rather interesting. And it tells us about, um, I would say this one falls under the heritage piece under, you know, people from the South love, love handing down items, especially from this era. Uh, and connecting to that. So I found this piece really interesting. This is now a part of our collection. Um, don't worry, it is, we very much put in its records that we don't, we don't know if this is part of his or not, but it tells a story. And I think that is really interesting. Next one is we collect from experiences that we remember. And for this, we're gonna go back to the Civil War again this piece of wax is on display in our Civil War exhibit. I will read the handwritten note to you. It says, piece of wax taken from the railroad train captured by the Union troops after the evacuation of Richmond, Virginia, on which the, in quotes, trash, in quote, of Jeff Davis was taken from Richmond, from J.D. Rears, et cetera. It has his regiment for the volunteers. I thought this was rather interesting. This, this is one of a piece of wax. We took a piece of wax out of a train and we made a note 
to remember this important piece of history. So here we have uh, the railroad broken down in Richmond and Petersburg. I thought it was even more interesting that when I pulled it off exhibit to see what it was all about, this was written on a little card where someone could uh, make a recurring donation to an orphanage. So I, I, this is so relatable, right? I don't know about you guys, but I want to keep something. I'll grab that piece out of the mail, jot down a note, you know, toss it in my files. That's exactly what we're seeing here. This is exactly what this person did. Um, and so this is where someone took very everyday items and made a little bit of history to remember to remember an event. Uh, at this point, I want to talk about this book right here. And I, I love this book. And this helped me to put together the ideas I had, uh, uh, the ideas that I had absorbed while working here at the museum. Someone at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History had put some of this together. This book specifically talks about souvenirs. And I think, I think this is so, so intriguing. Um, it talks about different things that people would take and, and the growth of souvenir taking. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit on the next slide about early souvenirs, uh, particularly from Mount Vernon. Um, well, let me go to that and then I'll, I'll wrap it. So here's a Mount Vernon souvenir. I was showing this to some kids during a tour today. <laughs> So it reads, the piece of paper here reads, this piece of wood was cut from the door of General Washington's tomb at Mount Vernon in June, 1819 by Mavis Lang, mother of W. Bailey Lang. And on the left here, there is a tiny scrap of wood tied to a piece of cardstock, which is tied to this scrap of paper. Now, when I first started, I, I was real skeptical of this. I, I looked as maybe some of you are thinking, why the heck do I care about a piece of wood that is st stuck to a piece of paper? Well, when I started doing research on how museums deal with ephemera, I discovered the Souvenir Nation book and they actually had a whole section on Mount Vernon souvenirs. What happened was early on, they kept losing coffins from George Washington and the same thing happened with Abe Lincoln. People would chip pieces off the coffin and take them home and it became a problem. It became a problem. They chip off pieces from the door. Um, you see accounts of people visiting Plymouth Rock and talking about the tapping of people with their chisels and their knives taking off a piece of Plymouth Rock, right? This is something we see a lot in at least the 17 and 1800s. Um, the really interesting thing about Mount Vernon is when the plantation of Mount Vernon started doing poorly in the 1850s, when they started going broke, they took advantage of this and they started selling, oh, here's a chestnut from the tree that was originally planted by Martha Washington's son. They started making a deal out of it. They started making money off of it. We also see stuff from the White House. The White House would give tours in the late 1800s, and they had problems with people taking snippings of the curtains. They go up to the curtain, they take a little snip and take it home. And it became such a problem that they started to sell little bits of things on the side in a shop. And this was the origin of the modern day gift shop. So if we're sitting here thinking to ourselves, why don't we do this so much anymore? A lot of it is because of souvenir culture, because now a lot of us have, well, and it also depends on your generation, right? Um, I would say older generations probably more likely to buy things from the gift shop. Um, and then younger generations, well, I took a selfie in front of Plymouth Rock. You know, I took a selfie at Thomas Jefferson's desk, you know, whatever. So it's really interesting to look at the, um, the progress of this. There's a closer of the written. This, I, I was just curious to find out who W. Bailey Lang was um, because on the past, whoops, wrong direction. On this note here, it mentions, well, the mother of W. Bailey Lang. Why do we care that you're the mother of W. Bailey Lang? Well, it seems that he was in a locom locomotive and railway business if this is the same W. Bailey Lang. So I found that rather interesting for that piece. 
So we see something similar here, uh, the souvenir bit. So here again, we have Dr. John. And here we have the hair of the great coin that he referenced, we think. Um, unfortunately, Dr. John is, he is still alive, but he is in late stage Alzheimer's and is no longer able to discuss these things. Um, so we're not sure if this is the hair of the great coin, but this is the only hair of the great coin that we have in our collection. So we're making a guess. For me, as someone who's you know, entire professional career has been at this museum right here. It is really cool looking at this coin because to myself, I think if this coin had never been sold to that 17 year old in Jerusalem, where would I be today? The, the fact that a coin like this could change someone's life so much, it does speak to that craving for physical connection that we're talking about. It's hard to put a finger on that craving, but I think this illustrates it a bit. Then finally, I want to talk about our connections to the people that we love. So this is from our collection. I love this. This is another example of some stuff that people didn't, some of my co colleagues did not want to keep and I very much wanted to keep. What we have on the bottom right here is a ledger. This is from the time of World War I. I believe the ledger started in 1910 and ended in 1918, I want to say. This was from a farmer who lived here in Kansas. And oh my goodness, it's so interesting to me. You read through it and most of it is, you know, Jackie lost a tooth and I bought 10 head of cattle and, you know, there was hail last night and it affected the wheat. But then, you know, every once in a while in the margin, you'll get, Germany declared war or, you know, wh whatever little political things you'll find inside of this ledger. For me, the thing I loved even more though was the stuff we found tucked in between the pages. And as I'm sure you can see here, one of the things was hair. We went through and it appears that there are six different sets of hair in this one wrapping. They're not labeled. I, I don't know who they belong to. Um, it is so fascinating because for at least my generation, I can't speak to anyone outside of our generation. This is just not something that's done. It, it, someone cared enough to keep these. And these are people that were cared for and there they are right there. Who do they belong to? Who were these people? I, I don't know. And I, uh, the, the question is tantalizing, you know? Um, oh, I should also mention inside of inside of this ledger, there was also, oh, I loved it. There was wrapping paper. There was Christmas wrapping paper. There were candy wrappers, just all these fun things that um, the collections manager at the time was like, oh, you know, maybe we'll throw those out. And I was like, no, no, no. Oh my gosh, no, I love, we did a Christmas display once and I'm like, here's old school wrapping paper from a hundred years ago, take a look at it. Um, I just love those things. Here we have a family Bible. Um, I was not open, able to open it to take pictures because of its fragile state, um, but this does have family records. This one, this one is really interesting in how it works. So these are World War I items, as you can see, that have to do with gas. So we have a gas alarm on the bottom right made out of wood. We have uh, the upside down U that is a uh, bell that you can hit with the piece of wood. We have on the bottom left, uh, early rudimentary gas mask. So you would put liquid or urine on the mask on the bottom here to help ne neutralize the gas. And then the mask on the top had little um, glass or plastic films inside of it. The interesting thing here is that this used to be on loan from a particular loaner. The loaner passed away and handed the things on to his son. And the son decided to leave them on loan here at the museum under the condition that we left them exactly as they are right here. If, if you can see close, uh, you might notice that there's some typos. And we were told, no, this, this item is a memory of my father. So it is rather interesting because this, this box is not all that it seems. It is, of course, about gas, but it is also about this gentleman's father and it in and of itself is a memory.
which I find interesting. So what does this mean for museums? Well, it's interesting because when I talked with Lauren about this back in January, I found out that the Western Heritage Center was doing a, uh, an exhibit on something very similar. And then a few days later, I found out that a local museum here, well, three hours away from me, the Kansas City World War I Museum Memorial, was also doing a similar exhibit. So these are exhibits talking about, they're self-reflective exhibits by museums, museums talking about how they do what they do and why they do what they do. So I wanted to share a few of these as well. So here we have pictures from the Western Heritage Center. Hopefully some of you have been able to go and see this in person. I wish I could myself, but it talks about what is a permanent collection? Why do museums hold things permanently? How much work does it take to catalog these items? Why do we catalog these items? How do we store them? So here on the left, you can see uh, the number of an item. So it ex explains what each of these numbers means. Uh, on the right here, you can see the kind of storage that these go into. Here we have some things from the World War I Museum and Memorial. I went here less than a month ago. I made my friends come with me just to see this one exhibit. <laughs> and I was thrilled. I was thrilled at what this was because this is exactly what we are talking about. Why keep that? Why do we collect these little, I call them ephemera, these little items that we consider um, able to be thrown away, right? Why are we keeping those? And why are we putting so much work into them? Because as uh, the Western Heritage Center is pointing out, as this exhibit is pointing out, it takes a lot of time a lot of time and a lot of work to take care of these items. So on the left here, we see a dance card uh, and it is filled out with the names of different ladies who will be dancing these dances with this gentleman. Of course, these are all World War I items, so keep that in mind. The one in the middle here I love, I will read for you in case you can't see it. It says there are three kinds of fools. One is fools, two is damned fools, Three is soldiers who ride on the tops and sides of cars. <laughs> if you expect to see the next block, keep yours inside. <laughs> and then the bottom one says, your head may be hard, but not as hard as bridges and tunnel arches. Only six inches clearance. Don't rub, ride on the tops and sides of cars. Keep your block inside. <laughs> so just a simple little sign that would have gone inside of a real car, but here we are a hundred years later laughing at it. I really liked how they, what they put on the wall at the end of their exhibit here. As you go back to your own homes and look at your own objects, consider them with a museum expert's eye. What will help future generations understand your experiences and your history better? And for me, a lot of times that is just those regular everyday items. Finally, I wanted to go back to Billings again. I was able to visit Billings in 2018 and see several museums there. And I thought it would be a good tie-in to talk about Moss Mansion. I loved Moss Mansion, by the way. I am jealous of you guys getting to live near it. Um, I thought it was very interesting that they had these, you know, just hair pieces, toiletry pieces, toys for little kids. Um, this one I found particularly interesting on the left, the headgear and the uniforms that would go with the Masons and the Shriners. For me, that goes back to that collecting for identity purpose, to show your identity as a Mason or a Shriner and see a little bit of that in Moss Mansion as well. So last part of my talk here. So if you have questions, get typing those so that I can see them. <laughs> Um, what does this mean for museum workers? I think the biggest one that I've had to learn to accept, and I think a lot of museum workers have to get used to, is that the items that are saved by people are not always the ones that are easy for us to educate with. So for me, I work uh, in good part as an educator and as an exhibit builder. And sometimes these items are not the ones that are easiest to teach with. You know, what I would really love is if somebody brought in, um, let's see, trying to think of a piece of history, George Washington's false teeth. 
you know, that would be great if I could, well, actually that would be sad. That would be problematic, but you get my idea. You know, something that everyone knows and I can teach directly from that. What I get is George Washington's hair and a chip of stuff from his tomb, right? But, you know, part of it is learning to celebrate this. And that's the point of this talk is that just because it's not the things that maybe I would want doesn't mean that I can't talk about history from that. It doesn't mean that I can't talk about how people are using the things that I receive. And I think historians and educators do best when they understand this and they're ready to celebrate it. Um, I think this also means, and many of you may have experienced this anytime you've been to a museum, it means that people go particularly, particularly to local history museums or history centers to find that connection, right? To go in and, for example, Moss Mansion look and go, wow, these are some of the first people in Billings. Um, or for me to go to the Wichita Cedric County Historical Museum and see the early mayor's desk, go, wow, that guy helped make my city. Or even for a museum like mine to go and look at mummies and think, wow, that lady was alive 3000 years ago. What was she like? What was her name? I don't know. It gives us that connection. It gives us perspective. And a lot of them have gift shops and allows us to take home that connection. Um, and then finally, what does this mean for a museum that despite our public mission, our efforts are often tied to visionary private individuals like yourselves, like me, like Dr. John, like many of our collectors. A lot of times the work we do, you know, we don't just open a museum and have artifacts issued to us. We rely on people who have this vision, who have that love of stuff, who understand what it is that makes people interested. And um, they, loan or donate those things to us. And that's what makes it possible for us to put up these things that are interesting to you and me. And what makes it possible for us to bring in kids and tell them about the Berlin Wall or about how Egyptians lived. Um, and that is really interesting to me. Questions. This is General Custer's underwear. This one has very good provenance on it. So you can be very sure that General Custer wore this. So. That's a fun piece of ephemera on my end. With that, I'm going to see if Lauren has sent me any questions. If you haven't already, uh, please send them in. I am ready to answer. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I, we don't have any questions as yet, um, but I, I had one. Cool. Uh, how do you see like working in a museum and working with such an eclectic and varied collection? Uh, how do you see your visitors really um, moving through your space? Like, like, do you see, are they connecting in a specific for personal reasons, for the connection to the history, for relaxation, or is it all over the place? Yeah, it's all over the place. I think some of the ones that are most noticeable to me um, and that hit me the most deeply are situations of either parents and their kids or even more so grandparents and their kids. Um, walking through, for example, our World War II exhibit, we have a, a little storage closet in the middle of our World War II exhibit. So a lot of times I'll be working in there and I can hear people's raw unfiltered reactions over the wall and it's so touching to me because what I hear is all, oh, there'll be a picture of, it's horrible, but Holocaust survivors, you know, these emaciated people in Dachau or Auschwitz, and you'll hear the parents or the grandparents saying, these people were put into jail because of their beliefs and we never want to do that again. Do you hear me? We're never going to do that again. And to hear, to see that multi-generational um, dialogue that it, it is there because of the work that I do is, is really, really fantastic. Um, I think for the ancient items, those tend to be a little more like, wow, that's interesting. Can't believe that people did that. But more of the modern items you see people collecting, connecting more personally to. And that really gives me a good feeling that I'm a part of that. 
do do you have a do you have a favorite unusual item either in your collection or that you've seen somewhere else that you really connected with and that you kind of wanted to collect for yourself? Yeah. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, one item that just comes up off the top of my head is from the World War One Museum exhibit. They had a tiny little card that they would send home with folks after they sent their dog to the veterinarian, and it said. Uh, this this dog is going on a very long journey. Be, please be very nice. It is a good dog. And it, I was like, man, people back then even talking about good dogs. I relate to that. Um, I loved, I, I'm not saying this just for y'all's benefit. When I say Moss Mansion, I loved it. I'm not saying that just because it's from Billings. I really did love Moss Mansion. I could spend a lot of time there. I loved how how preserved it was how they had the curling irons in the hole in the wall that would heat up the curling iron and you could pull it out and use it you know i could imagine myself in the place of the moss daughters um or the the shower you know they still had the shower head and you know stuff that we would throw out now we'd be like oh man that's old throw it out the fact that it was still there at moss mansion that they had the feather bed that has been there forever and nobody had thrown out I think even I had heard from some of the museum staff that it got to be a pain in the neck how much of the stuff people saved at Mouse Mansion, but it was also what makes Moss Mansion so good is that so many phone books and mattresses and door handles and things had been saved and that's what we get to look at now. It's kind of interesting the, the move of things from just old junk to we can put this on exhibit. We've noticed that at our museum. Um, sometime early on in the museum his, history, somebody put an old Commodore 64 computer in the basement with its floppy disks, you know, the floppy floppy disks. And when they put it down there, it had been in recent use and did they stop using it? And a few years ago, we pulled it out and put it on exhibit. So now we joke that we stick old stuff in the basement to begin the process of artifactification, going from being old junk to being artifacts. <laughs> so yeah, that's some of my favorite stuff. So all of those, all of those people who who are borderline hoarders, that there there might be value in the future. Mm -hmm. Yep. Possibly. I <laughs> not saying there necessarily will be, but <laughs> Well, we, we really appreciate you joining us, Kristen. Thank you so much for sharing your work and your research and um, a little piece of little pieces of your collection. Uh, I did want to remind everyone, this of course is the first in our High Noon series, which means our next High Noon lecture will be next month, April 15th. Uh, we're gonna be joined remotely uh, by Brianna Theobald, Dr. Brianna, uh, she is the author of Reproduction on the Reservation uh, is a book that came out in 2019, really, really well done. She is going to be presenting on Susie Walking Bear Yellowtail and health and healing on the Crow Reservation. Um, we are super, super stoked. It will be April 15th at noon. And so with that, we thank everybody for joining us and I hope you have a fantastic day.